Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm, I'm very excited to tell you about integrative medicine and what that is and the services that we uh, provide that might be helpful to you or your loved one. And uh, so we'll just go right on. All right, so first I'm just going to talk about modern medicine in general. And as we know, modern medicine is really spectacular. You know, with the discovery of antibiotics, the idea that you could come up with a magic bullet and make an infection go away and actually cure someone, that has basically been the paradigm that we've used for so many disorders. And yet, I think most of us know of individuals or ourselves who have suffered with chronic symptoms or problems for which we don't have cures yet, and we don't have those magic bullets that we can use. But it is pretty spectacular when you think in modern medicine that you could have brain surgery, like the gamma knife surgery, without even having any decision made on your scalp. Um, and you know, with the discovery of rituxan, the idea that you're going to take advantage of antibodies to try to kill lymphoma cells by injecting them into the body, it's amazing, right? So the question always comes up, is there really a role for traditional healing in modern medicine? We have all this great technology. There's always great discovery, especially at a place like Johns Hopkins, which is really known for its medical research. And I would answer, yes, there absolutely is a role for traditional healing. And why is that? Well, we know that chronic disease in America is highly prevalent. In fact, as a, I'm a, actually, I'm a gastroenterologist, and, uh, um, and I think that, that many doctors would tell you that, that most of the people that they see in their clinics or treat in the hospital suffer with chronic disease. In fact, 75% of our healthcare dollars goes to the management of chronic illness. And so you can see here what some of the most common uh, um, chronic diseases are um, adults and seniors face in our country, high blood pressure, lung disease, mental conditions, arthritis, diabetes, and heart disease. And if you look at the actual prevalence of chronic conditions by age, it's really astounding. So here, in the light gray bars, you see individuals who are ages 0 to 17, 18 to uh, 64, and age is greater than 65. And the light gray bars represent those individuals who have only one chronic problem. And you can see, as you get older, the likelihood of having a chronic disease really goes up. And then, if you, if, if for people who have two or more chronic conditions, you can see that also goes up as you age. And that, in fact, 62% of people over the age of 65 suffer with chronic conditions. So again, chronic conditions are those things that cause significant symptoms that interfere with the quality of life, for which we still don't have cures. And so how are we going to help patients and their families manage these symptoms? So this is where integrative medicine comes in. So integrative medicine is an approach where we integrate the best of scientific medicine or modern medicine with a broader understanding of the nature of illness, healing, and wellness. And we are going to try to make use of all therapeutic approaches and evidence-based modalities to achieve optimal health and healing. So this is where people ask me, well, what's the difference between integrative medicine, complementary medicine, and alternative medicine, right? Is there a distinction? Yes, and there is a semantic distinction. So alternative medicine means that you might be interested in therapies outside of the conventional realm, and that a person may actually choose to do those instead of conventional therapy. Complementary medicine means that you choose to do these other therapies in addition to your conventional therapy, but you don't really care how much evidence there is that shows that it might be helpful. But integrative medicine is very selective in that we don't offer the whole gamut of complementary medicines that are out there. We pick the ones that we think are going to be most useful for our patients, for which there is some evidence that it actually could be useful. So we have Johns Hopkins Integrative Medicine and Digestive Center. It's located in Lutherville, which is about 10 miles north of the, of the uh, hospital, just at the intersection of 83 and 695. So it's fairly easy to get to. And there, in under one roof, we have a um, multidisciplinary team. So who do we have? We have three physicians, me, the gastroenterologist. We also have a gynecologist and an internist. We have three acupuncturists. We have three licensed massage therapists. We have two integrative psychotherapists that can teach meditation, uh, guided imagery, do hypnotherapy. And we also have a nutritionist who's very interesting in that she not only does individual consultations, but she will actually do group classes for, for people who really want to transform the way they live. And our team here is committed to working with you, your family, and your doctors to, to support you during your time of chemotherapy or your recovery or, or even during palliative care. So th that's why we exist, and, and so communication is something we believe is so important. So it's very important to emphasize, though, that integrative medicine does not reject conventional medicine, but we only are seeking to enhance it. 
We do not uncritically embrace alternative practices. And again, as I said before, it is not synonymous with complementary medicine. You may, it, integrative medicines exist all over the country now, many associated with academic centers, but some are also independently, privately owned. And we, when you go visit different integrative medicines, you can see that they sort of have a different focus depending on where you go. So you're gonna find a variety of different therapies offered, but probably not everything all in one, one stop. So the kinds of things that you might see, so there's allo, uh, allopathy, which is the kind of conventional medicine that I was trained to do, and, and most of the doctors that you've probably encountered in an academic center is trained to do. But there's also osteopathy, homeopathy, and naturopathy. And then there's, of course, non-Western-based medical systems like traditional Chinese medicine, which includes techniques like acupressure, acupuncture, um, qigong, and uh, uh, herbology. And then there's Ayurvedic medicine, which is Indian-based, and that includes a, a things like uh, yoga and also herbal medication, too. So other healing modalities that you might encounter, massage therapy, energy therapy, uh, which includes Reiki, therapeutic touch, Qigong, and mind-body therapy. So what I was mentioning before with our integrative psychotherapists, cognitive behavioral therapy, hypnotherapy, guided imagery, music therapy, and Tai Chi. So when you go to an integrative medicine center, what can you expect there? Well, you're gonna get individualized patient-centered care. What do I mean by that? Well, we don't tend to label people by their disease. For example, if you have mesothelioma, we don't treat everybody who has mesothelioma necessarily in the same way. What we want to do is to get to know you and how you live and what's important to your life and, and begin to understand what your concept of what illness is and how we can best support you to feel as well as possible despite having a chronic problem. So our office visits tend to be very long, not very long, but longer than what you might encounter in, in a standard conventional medicine clinic, usually 60 to 90 minutes, but some of our practitioners will even spend two hours, for example, with a nutritionist or uh, with the traditional Chinese medicine practitioner. Return patient visit is 30 minutes. We really want to give you time and your family time to tell us what's been going on so that we can come up with the best plan. And, and I also really want to emphasize that we, we really want to engage you as an active participant. We don't feel that we're here to order you that this is what you must do and this is the attitude you must have, but we want to first provide education if you want it so that you understand why it is that you have the symptoms that you do and what kinds of strategies we can come up together. So the integrative medicine practitioner informs and involves patients in medical decision making and self-management coordinates and integrates medical care, as I said, communicates with your conventional medicine team, provides physical comfort, emotional support, understands the patient's concept of illness and your cultural beliefs, and finally, understands and applies the principles of disease prevention and behavioral change appropriate to different populations. So we really want to acknowledge you as an individual who has a disease, who has an illness, not simply as that person labeled by their disease. Okay, so what are some important questions to ask if you decide that you want to seek integrative medicine services? So first of all, I would ask, what are your symptoms that you're actually trying to seek relief for? Generally, you know, this is, this, is, this is for everybody, but you know, things like nausea, headache, bloating, fatigue, chronic pain, those are great symptoms for which we don't have, um, I mean, those are symptoms for which we don't have great, great pharmacologic therapies. And you know, let's face it, the Western medicine approach is to come up with a pharmacologic therapy. But you know, unfortunately, having treated many people with chronic GI symptoms for many years, I know that my pharmacologic armamentarium is somewhat limited. You have to make sure that you're not trying to look for these therapies to alleviate things that you should be much more concerned about. So in the general population, you know, red flags that should not be ignored, ignored are anemia, bleeding, weight loss, pain that awakens you from sleep at night. These are things that you should not use, try to seek out integrate, uh, alternative or complementary medicine for. You should first go see a conventional um, practitioner just to make sure that you're not missing something else that needs to be diagnosed or treated. I put this up here because this is, this is what I call the vicious cycle. When I see patients with chronic symptoms, when I find, so chronic symptoms can include chronic pain, fatigue, insomnia, uh, nausea, vomiting, constipation, diarrhea, a whole host of symptoms that can be very, very challenging to manage. But what happens is, is that when people experience these things, they it really, even though these things may not kill them right away, right, what happens is that their quality of life is severely impaired. And that can trigger feelings of anxiety and depression. And we know from studies that have been done that if you are anxious, if you are depressed, your chronic symptoms are only heightened.
right? And then with those symptoms comes a change in appetite, loss of weight. So to me, at our Integrative Medicine Center, we don't think it, oops, we don't think it makes sense to just simply focus on trying to alleviate the symptoms. We need to think about what is the impact of these symptoms on your whole well-being. So we need to treat, we need to address the anxiety and depression. We need to address issues of insomnia and fatigue. We need to focus on nutrition. And so often in cancer therapy, the focus is on the cure, right? But the journey is what patients actually endure, and we need to pay attention to that. So here are some um, uh, symptoms, chronic symptoms, for which there is some evidence uh, available to suggest that these therapies might be helpful. So what's listed here is anxiety, back pain, fatigue, insomnia, arthritis, nausea, hypertension. And there are studies that exist. Usually they're small studies and, and in that they don't involve a lot of patients. And they don't, aren't always those randomized placebo controlled trials that we're always looking for. Because let's face it, some of these therapies are really hard to control for. So for example, how would you control for hypnotherapy or massage therapy? Most people know whether or not they're getting massage therapy because people have a kind of an understanding of what happens to you when you get massage therapy. So it's very hard to, to blind a provider and blind a patient to getting massage. But anyway, so what I want to mention here, though, is, is that these different modalities have been shown to be helpful in managing some of these symptoms. So for example, anxiety has been managed with acupuncture, massage, and meditation. So um, that's just included in your slide set. So the other question you have to ask is, well, how good is the evidence that it will help me? So the first thing you want to know is, is there really evidence from clinical trials that a healing modality might improve my symptoms? Or is it really just sort of um, anecdotal evidence? You know, are, are people making incredible claims? Because if they are, I would be very, very suspicious. In those studies, were conventional medical practices used simultaneously with those other, other practices? That's really important because that's what your reality is. Again, most people who seek integrative medicine services or even complementary services, they want to do them in conjunction with their conventional therapy, but often they're, they're, they, they're very fearful of discussing with their conventional doctors their interest in exploring these other things because they don't know how well they're going to be received. But the reality is, is that most patients want to use conventional medical therapy with and, and exploring whatever other options there are out there that might really be beneficial. So again, are the results based only on anecdotal accounts? And you cannot compare yourself to somebody else's experience because you are a unique human being. So I would really caution you on going forward simply on somebody's, uh, you know, your best friend saying, oh, you've got to try this, you know, supplement because, you know, it gave me tons of energy. Well, maybe it worked for her, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you. That's not proof that it's actually helpful. Where can you get reliable information? Well, I suggest going to the NIH um, NCCAM website. It's provided by the government, and there you can read all about all different kinds of, of modalities, supplements, um, um, healing, other healing modalities, massage, et cetera, and read about what areas, what, what, where, where is there evidence that some of these things might be helpful. And hopefully, you've got a healthcare provider with whom you can talk about these things. I think there is recognition uh, that, that as conventional providers, we really need to familiarize ourselves and no longer isolate ourselves from what these other, other therapies are because our patients are actually wanting to use them and we want to be able to guide them because the reality is most people are getting their information from the internet and a lot of that stuff is not accurate. So how do you go about choosing a, a practitioner? Well, the first thing you want to do is, because some people will say to me, you know, I want to go to an acupuncturist, but how do I know if that's a good one? Well, it's really hard to know because, you know, for some disciplines, there is not a licensing body in that state. And uh, so, for example, in the um, state of Maryland, which is where I live, naturopathy is not licensed. It is licensed in a few states across the country, not very many. Um, uh, and it is actually licensed in Washington, D.C. So, and if you go to a naturopath, you want to know where do they actually get their training. And a naturopath, there are only six accredited naturopath, naturopathy schools. The other people who say that they're a naturopath got it sort of like an online degree. Those are not the people you necessarily want to go to. You want to be very selective. So you want to understand, what was their training? What, what are their credentials? Are they licensed by your state? Um, does, the, does the provider actually participate in continuing education? Do they teach? Do they do research? Uh, do, they, you know, do they ask questions? Are they constantly evolving their practice or are they just trying to sell you something? You know, just the same thing over and over again. 
And the other final question is, is your practitioner integrative or what I call disintegrative? Because there are practitioners out there outside of the realm of conventional medicine who don't want to have anything to do with conventional practitioners. And you have to ask yourself, is that the kind of practitioner you want? And I would, if, if I were looking for a practitioner, that's, well, that would be one thing that I would ask. Are you willing to work with my oncologist? Are you willing to work with my internist? And if the answer is, no, I don't really, you know, I'm going to really try to discourage you from using any of that Western medicine stuff. I want you to stop your chemotherapy. You have to ask yourself if, if that's what you really want. So in acupuncturists, for example, um, most U.S. acupuncturists are non-physicians, and there are 47 accredited acupuncture schools in this country. Now, my suggestion is that you find somebody who's certified. They have a national certification organization called the NCCAOM. You can go onto their website and you can see, if find a provider who has that accreditation. And it means that they have fulfilled their training, they've taken a test, that they are, they are truly certified by a standard body. And in, in Maryland, uh, acupuncturists are actually, um, they have board, they are, they're licensed. And uh, there are also different types of acupuncture, and it's hard to know what, what benefits one might have over the other. But just to be familiar with, some somebody might be advertising that they do Chinese acupuncture versus five element or Japanese or Korean acupuncture. There are differences, and you may have to ask them, like, with, with, particularly with your symptoms, do they really think that they have any way to, to help you alleviate some of those symptoms? What's their experience with that? Another question you have to ask is whether or not the therapy is actually safe for you. So, you know, people, we, a lot of patients come to the center, there's a, a lot of uh, supplement use. We don't particularly promote the use of supplements, and I'll get into that later. As, I, as a gastroenterologist, I have great faith in the digestive tract and believe that food is the best way for you to get the nutrition that you need and the, and the vitamins and the minerals that you need. But um, so people often ask, you know, what is the safety of these things? Well, let's just talk first about probiotics. So probiotics are these good organisms that people are taking in many different forms now. They come in pills, they come in packets. They are those good organisms that you often find in yogurt, those live cultures. And the idea is, is that taking a probiotic is somehow going to be beneficial to your body. And uh, we know that having normal flora in the colon is very important for initially the development of your own immune system as as an infant, but also we believe that uh, this normal flora provides a lot of other indirect benefits to us so that we can be healthy. So there's been a lot of interest um, in exploring the efficacy of probiotics, so taking these large quantities of these, quote, good organisms to see if that might actually improve symptoms. The kinds of symptoms that probiotics have been shown to be helpful to improve, and these are in small studies, and it's only a modest effect are, for example, bloating and irritable bowel syndrome, constipation and irritable bowel syndrome. Um, probiotics sometimes are useful in the treatment of people who have recurrent C. difficile colitis and trying to prevent a relapse. Um, so there are very, very limited uses. There, another, another use that we um, have seen is in ulcerative colitis in the treatment of mild to moderate ulcerative colitis, which is a type of inflammatory um, uh, disease in the intestine, and it can be useful in conjunction with conventional therapy. So again, Probiotics, for the most part, are considered pretty safe because, after all, they're kind of like the organisms that normally inhabit your colon. However, there have been a couple of case reports of people getting um, systemic Saccharomyces boulardii infection, which is Fluorostore, when they have a central line. So I would pretty much say that if you have a central line through which you're getting chemotherapy or nutrition, that you probably should stay away from that one um, uh, for the time being. So we also talk to people about the use of antioxidants. People want to take antioxidants because they feel that somehow that's, that's promoting um, finding, fighting cancer in the body uh, if, you can, if you can take large quantities of antioxidants. But there really isn't any evidence that antioxidants really do that. Your body produces natural antioxidants. You know, your body has its own mechanisms for protecting itself. And um, nevertheless, we still have people who really feel very strongly about wanting to use antioxidants. And we generally recommend at our center that you don't use them while you're getting chemotherapy or radiation. Because after all, one of the effects of radiation and chemotherapy sometimes is to generate free oxygen radicals that are going to help kill your cancer cells. So it doesn't really make sense to take antioxidants at a time when you're trying to take therapy to, to kill your cancer. 
Um, what about the safety of acupuncture? In general, acupuncture is extremely safe. There's a lot of concern that if you're getting chemotherapy, for example, and your uh, platelet count is very, very low, are you at risk for bleeding because somebody's sticking needles into you? But you have to understand that the needles are, first of all, they're disposable, and I would not go to a pr practitioner who, who, who did not use disposable needles. And the thickness of the needle, it's about like the thickness of your hair. It's very, very fine. And the depth of penetration is just, just like a, a one to two millimeters. It's very very, very superficial. And so it's felt that it really does not increase your risk of bleeding to have, have um, uh, acupuncture needles. You, sometimes people can get a little bruise, tiny, tiny little bruise right at the point of the needle, but that happens infrequently. And then uh, what about the safety of massage therapy? In general, massage therapy is very safe. However, we recognize that some people have had surgery, for example, breast cancer patients or you know, people who've had abdominal surgery, and therefore they may not really be able to tolerate a whole body massage and that it should be modified. And there are people who specialize in what's called oncology massage. It requires special training. So um, just getting back to supplements and herbs and safety, the, f the first question I always ask patients when they ask me, well, you know, what do you think about this? You know, should I take these? Are they safe? I want to know why do you want to take them? Like what, 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 what benefit do you think you're going to get from them? And often they tell me it's because they're very concerned about their nutrition, which we will get to. You have to understand that supplements are not regulated by the uh, FDA the way prescription drugs are. So it's very hard to know whether or not a company that manufactures supplements is, is reliable in that because they're not held to any major standard. The only standard they, they are required to follow by the government is that they must report any serious adverse effects to the government. But, but, it's, but it's up to them to report that. You know, it's not that the government is going to be proactive. So you, know, you, really, you really have to be careful because you don't necessarily know um, um, how reliable all the companies, all the products are that are out there on the market. And as a consumer, you're faced with so many different things. So what are you to do? Well, one way is you can go to an independent body. It's called consumerlab.com. So this is like a consumer reports type, type organization, which they periodically go in and they'll analyze like you know, 10 different ginger supplements and try to figure out how many of them actually contain the active ginger compounds and how, how many of them are just garbage. And so there, if you go on there, you can, you can read what their evaluation are, is for, for different types of supplements. And if you want to learn about herbs, because again, you know, we recognize that Chinese medicine is, you know, is a tradition that goes back, you know, perhaps 5,000 years, you know, and there are some people who, who um, would like to learn more about that, then go to an herbologist. This is not something you should self-prescribe. This is not something where you should walk into an herb store and just buy something off the shelf. You need to be, have an evaluation by somebody who really knows how to prescribe herbs, but they need to have an understanding of you as a person before you take herbs. So um, again, people who are trained in traditional Chinese medicine are going to have that herbology training. And then finally, if you're concerned about your nutrition and diet, I highly recommend that you see a registered dietitian or certified nutrition specialist. And if you're in, the, in Washington, D.C., if you can see a naturopath, that would be very useful too because they are very knowledgeable about nutrition. So, what, so people say, well, what is the best way for me to get the nutrients I need? Well. I, I would say eat a healthful diet, preferably one rich in whole grains and whole foods. And as Michael Pollan said, uh, who had wrote The Omnivore's Dilemma, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Now patients will say to me, well, how can I do that? I'm going through chemotherapy right now. My stomach doesn't empty properly. I have nausea. I'm vomiting. I have diarrhea. How is it that I possibly can get the nutrition that I need you know, by eating food? Well, this is what we tell people. You, you get a blender. It is amazing because we don't tend to think of food as being, in a, being nutritious if it's in a liquefied form, but actually, if you think about it, what does your stomach do every day when you eat? It liquefies what you're eating. And in fact, if you're having problems with nausea and vomiting, one thing to do is to go to a liquefied diet. And it's amazing what you can put in a blender. And it, you begin to f think of food in a totally different way. So there are all kinds of shakes and, and soups. There's a great cookbook I highly recommend. It's called One Bite at a Time. Um, you know, one of the, the it's, it's, it's written for cancer survivors and family members. One of the issues, I mean, there are many issues related to uh, nutrition, but, you know, many patients, when they go through chemotherapy, they lose their, their sense of taste, their taste buds are screwed up. And yet, this, this chef has come up with this, uh, this incredible set of recipes that are very enhancing. You, if you use citrus to enhance the foods, I'm not saying you drink a glass of orange juice, it's, but you're using citrus to enhance foods. 
and in combination of sugar and fats and you know it's it's amazing book I use it even just for myself for for my own household and nobody has cancer but it's 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 a great a great book you know and again you know things like staying away from lactose because you can become transiently um, lactose intolerant so you know there's this inclination that if you're losing weight then you need to eat high calorie foods and therefore you should be eating hamburgers and french fries and absolutely not because patients who are nauseated they will get full very quickly with foods that are high in fat and and it will make their nausea actually worse and it can trigger more reflux symptoms and all kinds of symptoms so there's so much we can do with nutrition and, and that's what we love to do at our center so how much will these therapies cost and that's another issue. You know, unfortunately, most of the, all these services that we provide are not covered by insurance. Um, nutrition counseling is covered by Medicare if you have kidney failure or if you have diabetes. So other than that, it's not going to be covered in general. Um, but it, for our nutritionists, it's $150 for the initial visit. And the acupuncture services are range from $85 to $150 per session. Again, the first visit is two hours, and then the one-hour visits are $85. So there are isolated insurance plans that may cover acupuncture. And again, I mentioned the Medicare coverage for nutrition counseling. Massage therapy is almost never covered, and it, um, uh, except by workman's compensation. So um, this is our website, hopkinsintegrative.org, if we can be of service to anyone here. And I, I will say that we have a program that's not just for, for cancer patients, but also for the caregivers. We recognize that caregivers need a lot of care, too. And, uh, you know, I also, I also recommend to people, you know, often you have friends and family members who are very well-intentioned and they always want to ask you, you know, well, what can I do? What can I do to help? And I think that if there was some way they could help provide some of these services for you or your, your, your loved one, um, or if they could even prepare meals, for example, these liquefied meals, but you have to be very careful and give them the set recipes so that they know that they aren't going to put, you know, a ton of butter and a ton of milk or, or whatever into the food that they're going to provide.